the key determinants of health of individuals and populations are the circumstances in which people are born, grow, live, work and age. And those circumstances are affected by the social and economic environment. They are the cause of premature disease and suffering that's unnecessary. And that's why we say a toxic combination of poor social policies, bad politics and unfair economics are causing health and disease on a grand scale. If you look at the scientific evidence, we would say that there's no biological reason why a woman in Botswana should have a life expectancy of 43 years and a woman in Japan should have a life expectancy of 86 years. And there's no good biological reason why there should be as much as a 28-year difference in life expectancy for men in the Scottish city of Glasgow. Yes, of course, there will always be social and economic differences within countries and between countries, but they shouldn't cause health and disease and suffering on such a scale. That's completely unnecessary. And that's why we say it's unfair, and that's what we mean by health inequity. If you look at the magnitude of the differences, for example, in life expectancy, within and between countries. A woman in Botswana has, has a life expectancy of 43, a woman in Japan has a life expectancy of 86. That's completely unnecessary. That's not a given. We don't have to say, oh yes, there'll always be differences. Let's just accept that. When we look within countries, we can see as much as a 28-year difference in life expectancy between the poor part of the Scottish city of Glasgow and the rich part completely unnecessary. Yes, there will always be social and economic differences, but not of such a magnitude to cause such unnecessary disease and suffering. That's grossly unfair. Closing the gap in a generation is not a prediction. It's an aspiration. But we do know how to do it. We do know how to create the conditions to do it. So in a sense, the responsibility is on all of us, the global community, to decide, is this a priority for us? We could do it. We could close the gap in a generation if we wanted to. We have seen remarkable improvements in health in many poor countries, low and middle income countries. Remarkable improvements, very rapidly over the last three decades, remarkable improvements in infant and child mortality, for example, and hence in life expectancy. The big issue is that those improvements have been very patchy. Richer people have improved more rapidly than poorer people in general. But the fact that you can get improvements suggests that we know how to do it. Now the real challenge is to spread those approaches more equitably. One of the things that surprised me personally was the power of collective action of grassroots organizations. I started by assuming that if the government won't do it, then it can't be done. And it's still true that you do need government commitment. What surprised me is how much can change with the power of people getting organized for themselves and pushing government to act. Us how important social and emotional development is for the development of the brain. In other words, it's not just a nice thing to do to care for your kids, it actually is crucial to their brain development. So that social and emotional, as well as physical and cognitive development, are crucial to the developing child and the chances of that developing child becoming a healthy adult. One of the best interventions you can do to improve infant and child health is educate girls who are then going to become mothers. Education of women is a key determinant of infant and child mortality, quite apart from education being important for people's own health. People use the term primary health care in a variety of different ways. Essentially, we mean care in, for and by the community. So it's at a community local level. It's the first level of care. So in general it doesn't mean you start by going to a tertiary care institution. Um, and to do it properly it has to take into account 
everything that we're seeing in our report on the social determinants of health. And we see also primary care as being oriented to prevention as well as universal access to treatment that is affordable. So it's not based on ability to pay. And so all of those principles are key. I think that if you look at what ministries of health are doing in most countries, they don't pay any attention to the wider social determinants of health. They say, it's not my issue. I'm not the Minister of Finance or Education or Environment or Housing or Transport. It's not my issue, so I don't do that. What we would like is Ministers of Health to be the advocates for action across the whole of government. Fundamental to our approach, the approach of the Commission on Social Determinants of Health, is creating the conditions for people to have the freedom to lead flourishing lives. That's what we think governments should be about. That's what we think well-organized society should be about. And if you create the conditions for people to have that freedom to lead flourishing lives, their health will improve and health equity will be promoted.